church. I look over and, and I see babies and babies getting handed off and, and I see kids and it's just such a glorious thing. Won't it be great to have a family pastor? We are, uh, I pray, looking forward to that and, and, and pray that God is leading just the right man here to Calvary Bible Church. It was uh, <clears throat> a blessing um, to have uh, uh, one such man and his wife visit us recently, and there were some of you that got a chance to meet them, and the rest of you will get a chance to meet them on the 21st. Just continue to keep that in prayer. <clears throat> um, let me go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, thank you, God, for calling us all together here this morning to worship you, to offer you our praise and our thanksgiving, to exalt you, to glorify you, and of course this means all for your Son, the Lord Jesus as well. I, I do pray, as Tim prayed, that, that this act of worship has been pleasing to you. And that you will be pleased with um, the preaching and teaching of your word. That, Lord, we will be quick to hear and listen and apply for your glory and honor. We pray this in your son's name. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> Before I get going, I want to just um, uh, address something that I had said last week in our message when we were talking about sordid gain and those people in the ministry that would seek to do things for sordid gain, and especially financially, I gave you some examples of uh, men who have earned great amounts of money from the ministry. There was one in particular, though, that I, I want to mention again, and that is uh, Stephen Furtick, Jr., and while he has amassed uh, quite a bit of, of wealth, um, he is one that, that, in the context of me mentioning these names, I feel like I presumed upon his heart, and I, I, I cannot do that. There are other people on that list that I mentioned that we could go back and, and see actual videos and hear things from them that would demonstrate just unequivocally that they were out for sordid gain, but I can't say the same necessarily about Mr. Furtick. So with that, I offer my apology because I need to be so very careful, and especially when I would say name names from this pulpit. And I do that for a reason. I do that because I think sometimes it is important for you to hear what is out there in the world and to know it very specifically and what it looks like. Um, and there might have been other, other things we could have talked about, about Stephen Furtick and some of the things even that he has said but again, the context that I presented him, and even somebody like Joel Osteen, and I mentioned Joel Osteen uh, in a more of a false teaching way, um, uh, but, but again, I have to be careful not to say that I know their hearts, and in this case, that they were out for sordid gain. I do think it's always a little strange when you have people in the ministry that, that have earned great uh, millions of dollars from the ministry, but again... <clears throat> that will be between them and the Lord. We are in a section of text, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> just having a little trouble this morning, that deals with false teachers. And last week I offered to you some unbiblical teachings, and again, specifically from Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers. This week I, I do offer you a couple of more, starting with a woman named Sarah Young. And her immensely popular book called Jesus Calling, in which she claims that God speaks to her and she writes down his words. In an earlier version of her book, she wrote in the introduction, quote, I knew that God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. Increasingly, I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day, end quote. Now the problem with this statement is that it seems to say that the Bible is not sufficient. 
that the Bible itself is not sufficient for Sarah Young, that it is not sufficient for all matters pertaining to her life and godliness, but that God needed to give her more. While in the introduction she acknowledges, quote, I knew my writings were not inspired as only scripture is, end quote. And then a page later, quote, the Bible is the only infallible inerrant word of God, and I endeavor to keep my writings consistent with that unchanging standard, end quote. Yet she never tells the reader how her writings would be different from scripture. In fact, she even chooses to speak for Jesus using the first person. Words like I and me and my for Jesus instead of using the third person like he would say this or he has said this and then quoting scripture. She says, quote, I have written from the perspective of Jesus speaking to help readers feel more personally connected with him, end quote. The problem is, now she is going beyond Scripture and putting words into Jesus' mouth, attributing her words to him. If indeed these are Jesus' words, well then how could they be any less authoritative than his words from the Scripture? In short, she's bringing into question the whole doctrine of the Bible, its revelation, its sufficiency, and whether or not it is the completed Word of God. Bible teacher James Montgomery Boyce wrote that the great issue of our day would not be the authority of the Bible, but its sufficiency. Would we trust it to be all that we need for life and godliness, or would Christians turn to other revelation and experiences? Would we feel like we needed something more? Jesus' calling represents just that trend. Young had the Bible, but found it insufficient. Now what's also interesting is that the book has gone through several revisions and made changes. Think about that. I noticed that while reading through uh, the 2016 version, she had already gone back to smooth over some of the controversial wording from her first introduction. And furthermore, if the book and Jesus' words needed revising, what does that say about the trustworthiness of the revelation she is supposedly receiving? One reviewer wrote this, quote, after all, why would words from Jesus need to be revised? Did God lie? Did he change? Did she mishear him? There is no good option here other than to doubt all she has ever claimed to receive, end quote. <clears throat> With that, please turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. And while the message title for last week was those who must be silenced the title of today's message is those who are defiled we might even say those who are defiled and unbelieving and while you turn there I want you to remember that last week we learned that though relatively little time had passed since Paul and Titus first established those churches on the island of Crete, false teaching had already come in and infiltrated the church. And that was partly the reason for Paul leaving Titus behind uh, while he went off to Macedonia, that Titus would then appoint elders in every city. This would help combat the false teaching that had come in. Uh, as elders would hold fast the faithful word, they would be able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict and not be fond of sordid gain. Folks, why don't you please stand for the reading of God's word this morning. <clears throat> we begin in chapter 1 of Titus and we'll read again verses 10 to 16. <clears throat> Paul writes, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. 
For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, this morning, friends, we are going to look at just these last couple of verses here in this section, verses 15 and 16, where we will see a a summary of what really amounts to kind of the overarching characteristics of a false teacher. And so along with them being rebellious, empty talking, deceitful, liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, this week you will see two more characteristics of those who must be severely rebuked and stopped. And the first is this, that they are defiled and unbelieving. False teachers are defiled and unbelieving. Back in verse 15, again we read, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. Well, so Paul here now contrasts two more groups of people. You have the pure and the impure. The impure then made up of two more characteristics, the defiled and the unbelieving. Let's start over here with the pure. Who are the pure? Well, they're the opposite of the defiled and the unbelieving, right? Uh, Pure, the word is katharos, which is pure, clean, clear, unsoiled, unalloyed. An alloy is two or more ingredients, usually metals that are mixed or blended together. In this case, pure signifies not two, but one ingredient. And so coming off of verse 14 and the fact that these false teachers were promoting Jewish myths and commandments of men, along with verse 10 being those of the circumcision, the Jews, the idea here is that these false teachers who were Jews, who have made a profession of Christ, were alloying um, or or mixing their Jewish faith and law-keeping with Christianity, which Paul says you can't do. And he puts them then in a camp of being rebellious, empty-talking deceivers to whom nothing is pure. In other words, they were teaching Jesus and Jewish myths and commandments of God and commandments of men, which are both totally incompatible with biblical Christianity. The two don't mix. And, and even when you, you try to mix them, nothing comes out pure. I think I mentioned last week like oil and water, right? And you can take the oil and you pour some into a thing of water and of course they stay separate. And even if you take that container and you start shaking up as hard as you can and as long as you can, right? And you stop. Well, what happens? Are they still, does it all mix up real nice? Well, no, now you've just, you've got these little tiny beads of oil, right? And it's still not mixing with the water. Now, also in opposition to the pure are the unbelieving. Believing in what? Believing in the Christian faith. Sound doctrine. The faithful word. That is what we have as believers, of course. Believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They believe in the key tenets of the Christian faith. They believe in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And you say, but even as a Christian, gosh, I don't know if I would call myself pure, right? Go ahead and uh, keep your bookmark there and turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 37. Chapter 11 of Luke, beginning in verse 37. <clears throat> 
Jesus has been preaching, he has been teaching, he has been doing miracles, <clears throat> and the crowds are getting bigger. Pick up with me, chapter 11, beginning in verse 37. Luke writes this, Now when he, Jesus, had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and reclined at the table. And when the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and of the platter. But inside of you, you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. In other words, Jesus is calling the Pharisees out for making themselves look good on the outside. Oh, holy and righteous while on the inside their hearts are full of sin. They're being two-faced. They are being hypocrites. And then Jesus reminds them that it's God who has made not just the outside, the physical bodies, and the bodies that obey these man-made laws, but God also has made the non-material part of them as well, known as the heart. And if they would fill their hearts with that which is good, then good is what will come out. In other words, inner purity or cleanness produces outer purity and cleanness. And this starts with a true love for God and an acceptance of his son as the savior. And if they if they have this, then all things done for the glory of God that come out of them will be considered clean. That is good and right in God's eyes. So one example of this would be in regard to old uh, dietary law restrictions. As Paul writes this in 1 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 5, where he talks about men who advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God in prayer. So then back to our phrase, to the pure, all things are pure, simply means that those who have now been justified by faith and not the law, they are the pure, and that which they now do to the glory of God are the things that are pure. Now, as we said at the beginning, Paul is contrasting the pure with the defiled and unbelieving. So let's talk about this, this word defiled. It literally means to stain, as in applying color to, uh, to a, a textile like cloth or, or, or pottery or glass. But it also means to tinge or pollute. Hence the understanding here. Some of these false teachers are defiled. They are polluted in the sense of what Paul has already described. Again, as rebellious, empty-talking deceivers teaching things that they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. And these are those that are not sound in the faith. In fact, Paul says to them that nothing for them or to them is pure. Nothing that comes out of them is pure. Pure, And we see another example of people being defiled in Hebrews 12 and verse 15. Go ahead and turn to Hebrews 12 for a moment. In Hebrews 12, <clears throat> beginning in verse 15, here the author of Hebrews has, has just addressed God's disciplining of those he loves for the purpose of their sanctification. When he says, and the author says in verse 15, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Let me just pause here for a moment and say, in other words, bitterness can cause many hearts and minds to become tainted, sinfully 
polluted. It's in this context then that the author offers this next example. Look at verse 16. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. In other words, we have this picture of, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it wasn't true repentance. His sorrow was simply because he lost the blessing, was rejected by God, and frankly was just not somebody who had a true love for God. This then is someone who has become defiled. Now back in Titus 1.15... Paul gets more specific about the parts of a person that become defiled, specifically when he says both their mind and their conscience. It's uh, one of my favorite go-to uh, resources, the complete word study dictionary of the New Testament notes. The mind here is understood as the seat of emotions and affections, the mode of thinking and feeling, disposition, moral incl- inclination equivalent to the heart. And then conscience is to know one's self. It's self-awareness. In this sense, it is that faculty of the soul which distinguishes between right and wrong and prompts one to choose the former and avoid the latter. End quote. Except for someone whose mind and conscience are defiled, in which case they are not thinking clearly, they are acting immorally instead their mind is polluted and their conscience acting contrary to god's moral standard now you you might be wondering hmm whose fault is that whose fault is that that their mind and conscience would be defiled i mean i mean did they defile their mind and conscious, or was it something that happened to them? In, in other words, was it out of their control? Were they born that way? Yes. Yes, to all of it. We know that from the time we were conceived in our mother's womb, we were sinners, defiled, and depraved. In that sense, it was, you could say, out of our control. But would any of us have done differently than Adam and Eve in the garden? I, I, I don't I don't think so. And then once we were born, of course, we willfully sinned. Our mind and conscience being defiled, we choose to sin, and that sin just perpetuates even more defilement. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6 and verse 5. This is prior to the flood. When the scripture says this, Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Then what did the Lord decide to do? Well, we know the answer. He destroyed every living thing in a worldwide flood, save for Noah, his wife, right? Their two sons and their wives, six of them. Well, now let's jump ahead to Genesis chapter 8. It might just be a page turn or two for you. Genesis chapter 8, the flood is over. They have come out of the ark. They've built an offer. Uh, they built an, um, excuse me, an altar and have been offering sacrifices to the Lord. And we read this in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of men. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Did you get that? How much has changed? Nothing. Nothing has changed. This is corroborated in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 when the prophet writes, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? The implied answer is, yes, no one, but the Lord. 
Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Back in the Gospels, Matthew 15. And we're going to pick up in verse 11. <clears throat> Matthew 15, verse 11. Here some scribes have come to Jesus asking why it was that his disciples were breaking the traditions of the elders by not washing their hands when they ate bread. And Jesus first answers them and then calls a crowd to him and he tells the whole crowd this in verse 11. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. And, and then, friends, in verse 15, I will just tell you that Peter then asked the Lord to explain this to them, to which he then replies, look at verse 16, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. A person is defiled because of sin in their heart and mind, not because they didn't obey some man-made tradition. Now, back in Titus 1.15, Paul also contrasts the pure with the unbelieving. Guess what the Greek word for unbelieving there means? Unbelieving. That's it. We see it all over the New Testament as somebody who disbelieves the gospel of Jesus Christ. When a man told Jesus that the disciples could not cure his demon-possessed son, Jesus said to the crowd, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And of course he heals him. In contrast to the faithful, sensible slave in Jesus' parable in Luke 12, he says of the unfaithful slave, quote, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Jesus said to a doubting Thomas in John 20, verse 27, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul shares how, quote, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And in Revelation 21 and verse 8, but for the cowardly and unbelieving, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, I, I know we, we mentioned this a little bit last week. It's, it's kind of strange, isn't it, to think of unbelievers, those that are defiled, entering into the church, posing as believers with a self-serving agenda to bring about their own gain, usually financially. And you think, I mean, yeah, I can't picture that. I mean, how, how, would, we, how would we recognize somebody like that? Well, because, friends, it's that classic wolf in sheep's clothing. I, I went and I actually looked up the, uh, the actual story. As a, it's a part of Aesop's fables and it goes like this. A certain wolf could not get enough to eat because of the watchfulness of the shepherds. But one night he found a sheepskin that had been cast aside and forgotten. <coughs> so the next day, dressed in the skin, the wolf strolled into the pasture with the sheep. And soon a little lamb was following him and was quickly led away to slaughter. Now that evening the wolf entered the fold with the flock, but... It happened that the shepherd took a fancy for mutton broth that very evening. And picking up a knife, 
went to the fold, and there he first laid hands on and killed the wolf. The moral of the story being, the evildoer often comes to harm through his own deceit. Now, as we learn from verse 11, the primary motivation for these false teachers was sordid gain. They would benefit by immoral means, most often financially speaking. And of course, there, there may be other reasons for false teachers to don the skin of a wolf and deceive the people, whether that be uh, for power or prestige, fame, or something else. When we were up there in the northwest corner of California, not far from the town of Reading, there is a church there called Bethel Church, headed up by a man named Bill Johnson, another false teacher. One of his beliefs is that our words have supernatural power akin to that of God when God spoke the world into existence. His belief is that just like God created with his words, we can create with our words. The context of the quote I'm going to give you is Johnson teaching people how to do faith healing. Up there at Bethel, they have a school of healing and they have a school of miracles and a school of prophecy. Don't anyone be getting any ideas and run up to Bethel. We're going to check to make sure you got, you know, and we're going we're gonna to stop you before you go. But the context of the quote, again, is him teaching people how to do this faith healing, which, by the way, is something um, that never had to be taught to those who could do it in the Bible. They didn't have to go through a class. He says, quote, As you're praying over them, command now the spirit of affliction. Loose that hip in Jesus' name. Command it gone. Just speak health into that hip. Some actually need a a creative miracle. There's degenerative condition in that joint. So the worlds were made when God spoke them into being, so speak to that new hip, end quote. Friends, we do not have this power to speak things into existence or to command the natural world in any way. And, and, And this not only elevates man beyond what the scriptures teach for man, but accordingly, it leads to a lower view of God. Another false teaching from Johnson is called Montanism. It's the belief and teaching that prophecy and direct revelation outside of scripture still continue today. That the Holy Spirit has a a special revelation for this present age... And he says this, quote, It's difficult to expect the same fruit of the early church when we value a book they didn't have more than the Holy Spirit they did have. It's not Father, Son, and Holy Bible, end quote. A few things here. To claim that the early church did not have Scripture is flat out wrong. But what's worse is this diminishing the authority of Scripture while elevating the role of the Holy Spirit in a way inconsistent with Scripture. And yet, this this insufficiency and diminished authority of the Bible is exactly what Montanism leads to. Johnson even goes so far as to teach that all Christians have the ability to prophesy, saying, quote, all of the people of God are carrying prophetic anointment, end quote. Really? Because the Apostle Paul even rhetorically asks in 1 Corinthians 12, 29, all are not prophets, are they? The implied answer is, no, they are not. This brings us to the second characteristic of a false teacher in our text today, the fact that they deny God. They deny God. Speaking of the defiled and the unbelieving, we read in verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. 
Now here, profess is to confess publicly or acknowledge openly. And I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say a statement here. And I, I want you just to, to think what's wrong with this statement. Here's the statement. Everyone who says they are a Christian is a Christian. Because it's not necessarily true, right? That's what's wrong with that statement. Um, I mentioned uh, up in the northwest corner there, in, in, uh, in, in Weaverville, the church that I was at was on uh, Highway 299, a main thoroughfare between uh, Reading and the coast, and it's actually called Main Street as it goes through uh, the town, and so we would get all kinds of folks uh, that would show up to the church looking for help. Uh, they wanted money, and they wanted food, and, and they wanted uh, vouchers for a night in a motel. And when they would do this and show up and ask for these things, I would always uh, interview them to really try and ascertain whether or not the, the need was a legitimate one. And, and most of them thought that their chances would be better that I would give them these things if they said they were a what? A Christian. Oh, by the way, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, Right? And, uh, and uh, you know, most of the time I would say it was pretty obvious that they were not. They were not. I mean, I could stand here and say, I am a professional pickleball player. I play the circuit. And, uh, you know, you would probably be like, yeah, you wish, you know. Or I could say, I am a world-class chef. And, you know, reality is I, I do okay smoking, you know, some baby backs on my smoker. Please don't tell Pinky the pig that, okay? But, yeah, I've yet to give her pork. She'll eat anything. I just don't have it in me to drop some pork on the ground. See if she'll eat it, right? I'm sure she would. In other words, we can profess a lot of things, but it doesn't mean they're true. And in fact... What does validate any claims we might make about ourselves? Our actions, right? Our deeds. If you were to show up here on a Saturday morning, like this last Saturday when we're all out there playing pickleball, it would be fairly obvious to you that I don't play the professional circuit. Or if you, uh, if you came you know, over to my house, you might enjoy some tasty smoked meats, but you wouldn't confuse me with Bobby Flay or even Vahak, Rocco, or Miko, all right? What does verse 16 say about these false teachers professing to be Christians? It says, by their deeds, they deny him. Deny being to reject, retract, renounce, or disown depending on the context. By their deeds, they are showing that they don't really know God and they don't really love him. So we would ask then, well, what kind of deeds are we talking about? What might they be? And Paul gives us a little help here by using three adjectives to describe these posers. First, they are detestable. It literally means they are an abomination as unto the Lord. I almost wish the, uh, the NASB translated it that way, abomination, because in my mind, that, it just abomination just comes out sounding stronger than even detestable. For instance, Revelation 21 and verse 8, which we read earlier, it does this, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable, it's the same word there, and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Secondly, they are disobedient, meaning disobedient to the Lord, to his word. It literally reads, they are unwilling to be persuaded. They are unwilling to be persuaded to truly know God, to truly love God and therefore obey his commands. We read in Titus 3.3, 3, or we will some, some point, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, it tells us that this life of disobedience is a path where one walks, quote, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. 
And then the consequences in Ephesians 5, 6, that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And then thirdly, these are those who are worthless, unapproved, unworthy, rejected, cast away. As in 2 Timothy 3, verses 7 to 8, which speaks of men who oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. These false teachers in Crete were worthless for any good deed because, frankly, they brought no benefit to God's people. Just the opposite. They brought harm. As God declared through the prophet Jeremiah, this is from Jeremiah 23, 32, when he said, Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit. That's a good description of them being worthless, declares the Lord. Sorry, I forgot to put that in there. And what we see here, folks, from verse 16 is a whole lot of blah, 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 lip service going on, right? But nothing in these men's deeds that would back up this claim of theirs to knowing God. 1 John 2 and verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. In fact, just the opposite is true. They are detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Now, here's what's interesting about all of this, because when we go back to verse 13, Paul says that these men should be reproved severely. And it is with the hope that they may be sound in the faith. And yet it would seem that Paul has made a bit of a turn here when we get to verses 15 to 16, because frankly, it's hard to imagine the, the descriptors here of being a true believer in sin, especially when they would be identified as unbelieving. Certainly, we would hope that they might get the gospel, get the gospel from Titus in that rebuke to truly put their faith and their hope and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross on their behalf, on our behalf, for wicked sinners such as us, and that through his death, his burial, and resurrection, we not only have forgiveness of sins, but we have the blessing of eternal life. And that is what we would hope that would have been shared with those that were defiled and unbelieving. And that is what I want to share certainly with all of you here this morning, that if you would put your faith and trust in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished on the cross on your behalf, and not just that he died, but he indeed raised victoriously to new life, you will be forgiven, you will be saved, you will have an eternity to look forward to with Christ. Now, what do we do with uh, all of this this morning as we kind of start to wrap things up here? I, I appreciate greatly an article uh, by blogger Tim Challies uh, called Seven False Teachers in the Church Today. He writes this, The history of Christ's church is inseparable from the history of Satan's attempts to destroy her. While difficult challenges have arisen from outside the church, the most dangerous have always been from within. For from within arise the false teachers... The peddlers of error who masquerade as teachers of truth. False teachers take on many forms, custom crafted to times, cultures, and contexts. 
Here are seven of them you will find carrying out their deceptive, destructive work in the church today. Please note that while I have followed the biblical text and describing them in masculine terms, each of these false teachers can as easily be female, end quote. And the list is as follows, with just a I'm not giving you the whole thing here, just a a brief description of each. Number one is the heretic. The heretic is the person who teaches what blatantly contradicts an essential teaching of the Christian faith. He is a gregarious figure, a natural leader, teaching just enough truth to mask his deadly error. Yet in denying the faith and celebrating what is false, he leads his followers from the safety of orthodoxy to the peril of heresy. A couple of passages here would be 2 Peter 2, 1 and Jude 1 and verse 3. Secondly, we have the charlatan. The charlatan is the person who uses Christianity as a means of personal enrichment, personal gain. And we might look at 1 Timothy 6, 3 to 5, and Acts 8, 8 to 9. Thirdly, we have the prophet. The prophet claims to be gifted by God to speak fresh revelation outside of Scripture. New authoritative words of prediction, teaching, rebuke, or encouragement. In reality, though, he is commissioned and empowered by Satan for the purpose of misleading and disrupting Christ's church. And for that, we can turn to 1 John 4, 1, or Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. Fourthly, we have the abuser. The abuser uses his position in leadership to take advantage of other people. Usually, he takes advantage of them to feed his own sexual lust, though he may also desire power. For that, we could turn to 2 Peter 2, 2 and Jude 4. Fifthly is the divider. The divider uses false doctrine to disrupt or destroy a church. He gleefully divides brother from brother and sister from sister. And for that, we could turn to Jude 18 to 21, Galatians 5, 22, and Ephesians 4 and verse 3. Sixthly, the tickler. The tickler. It's not what you think. The tickler is the false teacher who cares nothing for what God wants and everything for what men want. He is the man pleaser rather than the God pleaser. For that we could turn to 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 4. And then lastly we have the speculator. The speculator is the one obsessed with novelty, originality or speculation. They're trying to show something new and flashy. We might turn to Hebrews 13, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 3, or 1 Timothy 6, verses 20 to 21. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, Pastor, okay, I'm not trying to be prideful here or anything, but I I know I'm not any of those. I'm not those kinds of people. And, and, And again, it might be hard for us to imagine one of these kinds of people being in our church or infiltrating the church, someone from the outside coming in as one of these, but we, we have to just be reminded, friends, always, always we need to keep our guard up. We have to make sure that we are at all times vigilant watchmen, always on the lookout. Now, that being said, not in a, an overbearing or all-consuming way or in any sort of a legalistic sense, but yes, diligent. Nonetheless, and lastly, I would say maybe it is good for us to take stock of ourselves and and ask ourselves the question, are, are, are the things that I do, sins that I commit, that if someone saw me doing this one thing, they might think me to be impure, defiled? unbelieving, detestable, disobedient, or worthless? Or another way that we could look at it, in what way do your actions either confirm or deny your profession of faith in Christ? Let us think about 
these things and let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. It is, boy, in this arena, certainly not ambiguous, Lord, at all. It is very clear. Help us, Lord. Help us to be good watchmen. Help us to be um, just vigilant and diligent, Lord, always looking for that wolf in sheep's clothing, but, but, but not to the, the degree, Lord, where we start to become legalistic about things or in our dealings with one another or in any way impedes our love for one another. Um, and, and Father, help us also just to take time to take stock of our own heart. And Lord, we all struggle with sin. And Lord, but if somebody out there in the world were to witness some of our sin, what would they think about us? Would they kind of naturally lump us into one of these categories? It's a good reminder for us, Father, that people are always watching. And Lord, no, we don't want to sin, right? We, we want to be just godly followers of Christ. And lastly, Lord, that if there are any folks here today that need to know Christ as their Savior, as their Lord, that they would repent of their sins and trust Him to be that Savior right now, even while we are praying. And Lord, we pray all of these things in Your Son Jesus' name. Amen.